Okay, hello, welcome everyone to my little talk on DMA buff heaps. Um, uh, when I was planning this, I was expecting, um, well, I knew it would it would be virtual, uh, but maybe I was expecting a little bit more, uh, kind of like a moder moderated uh, Zoom talk. Um, but it looks like what we've got is questions uh, in a question box. So I think what I'd like to, to, to have happen is we, uh, if you'd like to ask questions as we go, I'll just go back and after each slide, uh, review a couple of them uh, so we can try to keep it interactive uh, the best we can. Um, okay, so again, talk is on DMA Buff Heath, which is our new little Linux user space interface uh, for allocating buffers. And we're gonna go over its uses, history, and a little bit of the why, which um, will kick it right off. Um, so it works well to, to start with what we're trying to solve, I think, uh, so that everyone can get on the same page and hopefully everyone can come to the same conclusion that this is uh, the way we should be doing things. Um, so the way things uh, evolved, we, we have all these different frameworks, uh, DRM, V4L2, remote proc, uh, the trusted execution environment framework. Uh, and they've, they've all come up uh, independently, uh, which is fine. And they all use buffers, again, which is fine. Um, but at some point you would like to share them in a zero copy fashion. And so this is where DMA buffs come from. Um, these, uh, this allows these frameworks to export their buffers that they're working on uh, as a file descriptor uh, in user space file handle. Uh, and they can be shared and imported into other uh, frameworks. So uh, that's what that is. Um, one of the things we got going on, though, is that the memory areas that are exported themselves are not necessarily part of the device that's doing the exporting. So, for instance, uh, like a graphics card would be DRM. But when you get a dumb buffer, uh, what happens is that's just going to come from like a CMA area or normal system memory. Um, which, of course, does not belong to the graphics card. That is not GPU memory. Um, so that's one issue we've had. And there's also non-standard memory uh, locations. So SRAM, uh, Tyler memory is one that I'm familiar with. We'll go over these here in just a moment. And to, to export these, they need to be basically shoehorned into some existing framework. Uh, the one example that I'm kind of really familiar with is, is the Tyler memory space. Uh, again, we'll go into that. Uh, and it was basically put into the DRM memory space because um, it needed to go somewhere. And so we've, we've got these memory spaces and we have no good way to export them. Um, so what do we do? That's the question we're trying to solve. Um, so we'd like to go into a little history of a couple of the existing uh, memory allocators. Uh, there's a lot of pieces and they all come together. Um, so it's not very linear. So we're gonna talk about some existing memory allocators, then go into DMA buff and DMA buff heaps. So uh, one I'm familiar with is the Texas Instruments Allocator, CMEM. Uh, we're not the only ones to do this. Uh, NVIDIA had NMAP, Qualcomm had PMEM. Uh, and what they do is, uh, basically exactly what ION does. They, they allocate memory and they carve out memory. So uh, the way CMEM worked was a little hacky. Basically you could define your start and stop and memory allocations as a module parameter. So when you mod probe, you can give it all the different pools and, and stuff like that, or uh, device tree. <clears throat> it could be, uh, you could define your areas in device tree. This was tacked on later. Uh, Rob Herring would not approve of this, and for good reason. Um, it's basically in everything in the kitchen sink API. You can allocate from pools, blocks, everything that was needed. Uh, we would just add it. Uh, because it's not a tree module, we can do whatever we want. So we were just adding to, to make it work with what we, what we needed. So it was extended over the years, had a lot of V2s, so uh, CMEM allocate 2 because we forgot something and we had to make a new API, 64-bit. Uh, uh, this was all designed around early OMAP platforms, which were all 32-bit. So when 64-bit showed up, 
Uh, we were giving out physical address spaces, which still only needed to be 30, 64 bit from 32 bit and all the types had to be expanded. And so we just kept adding and adding and adding. So uh, the next thing we did, let me just click next here. Sorry. Uh, we started by transitioning to ION. And we thought, well, ION is going to be the future. It's, um, it's a lot cleaner API. And we got to work on that. And that's kind of how I started getting involved in all of this, uh, as I was tasked with converting a bunch of applications over to ION. Uh, the feedback I got from a lot of the uh, software teams I was working with is that, well, ION is also uh, not upstream. It's in staging. So it also changes, which basically means we, we're, we're fixing a problem with another problem. Uh, they said, why, why should we move to something that's also not stable and also not upstream? So good point. So started working upstream. Let's get ION destaged. Um, let's go talk a little bit about ION first of all. So ION is an Android thing. It started out as an Android thing. We started using it for everything. Um, basically, it's generic buffer sharing uh, allocation framework. Started out doing a lot of things um, and eventually shrank over the years uh, as DMA buff uh, showed up. So let me skip right to DMA buff heaps. Like I said, ask questions as I go. I'll just make this interactive as you want. Um, DMA buff heaps, uh, hopefully a lot of people are familiar with this. If you're not, it's uh, it's that uh, common mechanism to share buffers across devices is, is how it's usually presented. Basically, uh, you as a driver can export your memory, and as another driver, you can import that same memory. Uh, provides a bunch of just little APIs like that. Um, and it's really the foundation for everything uh, DMA buff heaps does. Uh, so it's, it's important we, we talk about it a little bit. And as we see here, user space applications started to use this more and more. So OpenCL, for instance, uh, you can import it as a memory area uh, if you can get a DMA buff handle. Uh, EGL accepts it, and you can make an EGL image out of a DMA buff area, which then allows you to pass that down into the OpenGL layer or OpenVG. Um, as textures or render buffers, uh, V4L2, and the DRM framework, of course, uh, it's kind of where it was originated from, all basically can consume. And a lot of these can also export uh, those frameworks. So as long as someone's giving you out DMA buffers, uh, you can just use them in more and more frameworks. So the really the, the question we're trying to answer is, who should be giving out these uh, DMA buffs? Uh, because most people just want to consume buffers and write to them. Uh, they don't necessarily want to be handling uh, the back end of uh, how do we export them, the cache operation, stuff like that. So that's brings us right into ION. And I don't want to beat up on ION here, because um, really ION is, is what ev it evolved into DMA buff heaps. So, uh, but I would like to go over a couple of the, the the pitfalls or shortcomings we saw uh, while working with ION uh, so we know why we went and made the decisions we did with DMA buff heaps. So with ION, we had lots of legacy. Um, Pre-4.12 ION kernel was a, was a bit of a different ION than, be, than the post-4.12 uh, ION. This led to a lot of projects having a couple sets of headers. Um, that's kind of also a problem with uh, being in staging is that you don't get your UAPI headers exported along with the rest of them. So a lot of projects just had to carry a copy. Um, so ION started to, a lot of the things that it did started to get replaced by DMA buff. So things like synchronization, um, you know, ownership of the file handles, uh, stuff like that, we could all start doing DMA buffs. And so, more and more of the core of ION kind of got they got pulled apart. Um, and another issue we had uh, was that the flags, so ION basically has like a central handler for the flags you pass in. Uh, but the actual 
heaps that you were allocating from didn't have to respect those. So we had a cached flag. You could say, I would like caching memory or I would like uncached memory. Uh, for instance, if you're allocating from an SRAM area, you're always going to get uncached memory. And so your flags didn't really do what they were supposed to be doing. And if you didn't know that, then doing a cache operation on an uncached area could break coherency in some systems. So we'd like to solve that. Oops, excuse me. There was also one device file. It was dev ion, which, for instance, with SE Linux and Android, we're doing file-based permissions. You, uh, you only had the one file granularity. So, for instance, if, if you wanted to give out the ability to allocate from maybe a CMA region to a bunch of users, but not the system memory, which is a valid thing to want to do. Uh, if, if you give out the ability to allocate from system memory, it's it's uh, it's kind of like a fork bomb. It, it can allow you to simply drain all the system memory and then bad things happen. So we don't want that. So we want finer grain control over what heaps certain programs can allocate from. So we need more files. File per uh, heap is what we went with. Uh, Android Ion probably did too much with one interface. It was had a pseudo constraint solving interface, so you would you'd give it a bit field of the heaps that you could accept from, and it would try to allocate the best, although it basically just went the first that matched. So we don't want to we don't want to try to do that in common code anymore. Um, same thing with cache management. Basically, it should be up to the individual allocator whether you want to uh, do any synchronization operations uh, on your cache. When you do them, do you do them at map time, allocate time? When do you zero the heap? All that stuff uh, was trying to handle in the ion core so that every heap looked the same, but they, they, they weren't the same. So we started to get vendors who would modify the core and if you modify the core, you can't upstream it uh, because it's 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 hacks specific to your heaps. Um, lastly, there was just a fair amount of DMA abuse. Basically, things would work on ARM but wouldn't work anywhere else. So, um, like Sync 4 device, we would do that uh, for memory that didn't actually have struct pages backing it, and it works on ARM for some reason. I don't. I never figured that out. But it doesn't work anywhere else. There's, there's no guarantees that works. So we were abusing the API. Um, let's see. So we introduced, basically, we saw that what was happening. Uh, I say we, it's basically me and uh, John. There was several others. Uh, the mailing lists kind of gives a history if you want to actually look into it. Uh, saw that ION was basically kind of shrinking until, well, we thought it was just going to get distilled down to its its its, its core operation, which is uh, this API with user space to allow for allocations. And so uh, I first pushed a patch that basically stripped out everything out of ION, and I got a lot of pushback and it was valid because if it's still called ION, if it still looks like ION, people are going to get confused. Uh, and so we basically did a rebranding uh, and called it DMA buff heaps. It's a little bit more uh, greppable than ION, but you know, we're we're still trying to figure out if we want to call it DMA heaps or DMA buff heaps. Anyway, uh, what this allows us to do uh, basically was a just a really thin shim layer uh, that allowed allocations from user space and passed them straight on through to a specific heap. So all the logic goes into the heaps and not into the core. So uh, you would basically have your, your heaps deal with everything, uh, like the coherency, whether it's a contiguous or not buffer, all that goes into the backend, and basically allows for for centralized uh, exporters. So instead of having all the exporters in individual frameworks, you have them all 
in one system level central heap. Uh, we got several types of heaps though, so we'll go into that next. Uh, so I want to give some specifics here. Just uh, one, like I said, that I'm really familiar with is the DMM Tyler. This is uh, an IP that's available on OMAP, OMAP class devices, and it basically sits out by the external memory interface. And it allows you to do all sorts of kind of cool things like uh, rotating images, um, basically transparently, which is, is super useful for uh, Android and stuff like that, where you're, you know, spinning your phone and stuff, and you, you never know the orientation, the buffer's going to be in memory, but you have to do it through a window. So it's it's basically an IOMMU that sits out even past the the CPU can still use it as Windows. So the question is, how do we how do we expose this? And back when this was originally being implemented, uh, 2011 timeframe, we really only had the DRM framework, and so everything was just put into the DRM framework. You could go OMAP, buffer object, new, and a tiled, and you would get a, a buffer, a video graphics buffer. Uh, there was actually a window into the tiled space, and then you could export it with a DMA buff export. Uh, but wouldn't it be better if what we do is, if we actually had a device, it was just a Tyler device. Uh, and that's what DMA buff heaps is allowing us to do. Once that's done, we can get rid of all the OMAP specific buffer, buffer handling from libdrm. So uh, that's another use case. Uh, SRAM, so we're working on SRAM heap. Uh, patches have been posted upstream there at the bottom if you want to take a look at them. Uh, I think we all know what SRAM is uh, and how it differs from our regular DDR space. Uh, SRAM has a couple challenges uh, when working with it. It's not in the normal kernel mappings. So it's usually out in device memory um, if it's memory mapped. Uh, it's not cached, and that's not needed. Uh, for instance, on our K3 platforms, TI's K3 platforms, uh, the SRAM and the L3 cache are actually the same memory. So there's really very little reason to try to cache this. You're not going to get a huge speed improvement. Uh, the SRAM locations actually already had an existing way to export to user space. Uh, and you could do read and write. And it was kind of like, you know, the, this, this peek and poke uh, interface. Uh, but you couldn't in-map, and then you couldn't pass this up into other drivers. So the other drivers would have to specifically know about the SRAM location and do this whole uh, OF get pool, alloc pool, and then do a virtual to physical. It's not standard. Whereas if we expose the SRAM area using DMA buff heaps, you get a DMA buff handle, and then you can do all the normal operations on it. You can map to it and read and write and do all your coherency operations. And it'll do the right thing in the back end. It will not actually perform cache operations because those would break your system. So uh, one pushback we got when trying to upstream this particular heap was uh, how do we deal with the fact that there's already a way for user space and drivers to interact with the SRAM regions? Um, and should we should we make them exclusive? So that's also on this L LKML list. If if you want to actually look into the reasoning, yeah. I'm just going to read the questions for a second here. Okay. Uh, just want to go through a couple more types of uh, heaps to get you an idea of what's out there. Uh, secure buffers, these are an interesting one. Uh, there's really, there's two types of firewalls I've seen in most systems. There's the static type where uh, at boot time, a uh, chunk of memory is locked off and it is considered your firewall region. Uh, Non-secure user access cannot be performed on this uh, region. There's a certain set of permissions on it. So this would be a, a carve out heap. Um, there's no map. Um, let's see. 
And then there's dynamic firewalls, which uh, arguably are the better firewalls, uh, but they might not be from a safety perspective. It's hard to tell. So everyone goes one way or another. Uh, but these will actually, you can allocate from normal memory and then apply the firewall to them later. So here's any memory. Uh, and then when you attach it to a specific device, you can lock it to that specific device or, or use whatever policy you want because in the heap, you can decide the policy. Uh, I've already converted uh, the Optis uh, X test to DMA heaps uh, from ION. Uh, so I'm gonna post the patches for those here soon. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a lot of deletions basically because you can see that they carried both the new and the old ION versions uh, basically as their headers in the, in the project. So let me just look at the questions really quick here. Okay. Okay, let me, let me just throw this question out there. I think you all kind of see this. So the question I'm answering is, why would Linux need access to the SRAM regions? Um, and, and why don't they just use for things like the bootloader, like our SPL? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the answer, at least for AM5, is the DSPs, basically. The DSPs are going to perform much better. It's, it's something like a guaranteed two-cycle latency to the SRAM regions. So if you're gonna take a buffer and you want to do some operation on like an open CL operation, uh, you're gonna want to allocate from, uh, you know, an SRAM region if you can. Uh, and actually I have a slide on that. So we'll do that one here in just a moment. Okay, I'm at the slide. I guess it was next. Uh, so with our open CL implementation, what we had before was we would have these specific uh, allocate from DDR, allocate from uh, MISMIC, which is our name for our SRAM space. Uh, and then you could turn that into an open seal buffer. And this would allow zero copy, which is what we want. Uh, whereas if we have some way to allocate from these locations ourselves, uh, DMA buff heaps, then we simply can pass in uh, using like CL arm import memory, uh, much more standard uh, API. So, so that's that's basically where you would uh, need your SRAM. Uh, in AM5, it's not that big of a deal because I think you only have like a megabyte. Uh, but if you have uh, like a K2 device where you have eight or more megabytes, you can put whole images that you're operating on right in the SRAM regions, which is uh, going to show some improvements. And it should be up to the user space to decide when to do that because uh, it's a policy thing. Um, so we've already converted everything over. So OpenCL on TI platforms, you're going to get it uh, using DMA buff heaps as the back end on all 64-bit platforms. There's a lot more uh, legacy stuff on the, the previous platforms, uh, and so that's actually in the works. It's I can't guarantee you'll get it if you're on an AM3 or AM5 device. Uh, one issue we did run into when doing our OpenCL conversion here uh, was that uh, DMA buffs only allow the cache operations on the entire buffer. You can sync for device or for CPU on the entire buffer, which OpenCL allows you to create sub buffers out of existing buffers. And so if you only wanted to flush half a buffer or invalidate half a buffer, uh, you would have to invalidate the whole thing, which might not be what you want to do and you could lose data. And so the way we worked around this uh, now is we would, whenever you make a sub buffer, we actually copy it into a new buffer, which is kind of hacky, but it's, it becomes technically correct. Uh, and I've seen this issue pop up with some graphics related DMA buff issues where you would want to only flush uh, a given window as part of a larger buffer. So 2D flushing, uh, and strided flushing and stuff like that are also things we're working on and hopefully we'll solve this issue too. So that's, that's in the works. Uh, another issue we ran into is a uh, remote proc subsystem. So this is one where we didn't really have a good way to allocate to begin with, but we could import buffers. So the idea here is that if you're loading firmware or if you're passing to a remote processor, a big buffer, 
Um, what you need is a physical address because your remote CPU, uh, when it gets its message, please operate on this buffer, it's not going to see through the MMU of the CPU. It's going to be uh, through a bus address. And this is supposed to be transparent to user space. You do not want your user space knowing about physical addresses for security, and it's, it's just not clean way to do things. So what we're looking for is a way to basically take a DMA buff handle and pass it as a remote proc message, like an RP message, and have it on the other side come out as just a physical address after the Linux sets up any IOM use. And we actually have this in our little TI evil vendor tree because uh, we have remote proc, uh, remote procedure call. So we can basically say perform an operation on this handle and on the remote proc side, it gets the right uh, physical address. So not really sure how we're going to do this upstream, but uh, it's in the works. Uh, and it's, I think, a good example of where DMA buff heaps uh, basically is, is doing something that could not be done before uh, because we didn't really have the exporters in the remote proc subsystem. Um, <clears throat> And I think I got a link to this in the end, but we've also converted our IPC examples, a couple of them, to DMA buff heaps. Uh, most of these were in a two-stage process where we converted from CMEM to ION, and then once we realized DMA buff heaps uh, was going to be the, the, the thing we were going to use, uh, we then converted from ION to DMA buff heaps. And I don't know how well you can see this image, but you can see that on the bottom one, it was much easier, just uh, 18 insertions, 18 deletions. It was basically just a rename. So DMA buff heaps is really is just ion uh, under a different name, and it's pretty similar. So uh, when converting, if you're already using ion, you're in really good shape, which brings us to Graloc. Um, so this is another user. Basically, you give it a bit mask. It, it handles the constraint solving in user space, which is where it belongs. It's um, really not something that's ever been worked out well in the kernel. There's been attempts, but it's doing it in user space seems to be the right way to go. Uh, at least for our Graloc, we always just go and use the DMA buff CMA heap, which is fine. And it was really trivial to convert over uh, our Graloc uh, from ION to DMA buff heaps. And if you want to see that, it's all on uh, git.ti.com slash Android. Uh, cache management, we talked about this a little bit earlier. So uh, this is kind of one of the big gaps uh, John's working on, John Stoltz. Um, uh, at least on Android side, a lot of the software uses this consumer-producer pattern. So uh, buffers are given out to the different uh, different pieces of the software. Uh, they use them. And then they completely deallocate everything. They unmap and then pass it back to get given out to the next step. So when doing zero copy, uh, it's really hard to know when a device is actually done using it or whether it's um, going to get passed right back into another device without the CPU ever having use of it, which means we end up doing a whole bunch of extra cache operations uh, something that Ion was able to get around a lot of vendor heaps, uh, vendor Ion heaps, they would they would just hack away the the cache management, and it would allow their systems to be really really fast because you're not doing any cache operations in between, uh, giving out the different pieces, uh, the buffers. Uh, how do we do this in a generic upstream way? That's still being debated. Um, it might be what we're thinking is if the different users can tell us, uh, add some hooks to the DMA buff API, where did we actually write to this heap? Uh, and then the exporter basically can choose uh, to do the right thing uh, because it has this extra information. It knows that these particular devices either are coherent with each other and the CPU never used it, so we don't need the uh, cache operation or whether we do. Uh, and John actually did a really, really great write-up uh, 
or LWN. So if you go to these links, uh, it's a good read. So uh, what's next? The final bits, pieces that we're looking to fix up uh, before we can call it done. Uh, basically, heaps are accessed through device file systems. Uh, and you have to know the name of the heap you're going to be using. And you have to know what type of heap it is. So it requires a bit of pre-knowledge. Uh, you know, I, I know that this heap is contiguous, and it's cached, and it's secure, and it has these properties. And I have to know the whole name to it to use it. And this makes an ABI out of something that really shouldn't be. Uh, so we're hoping to get some kind of interface in, between, in front of it, like a library, like a libion had, where, uh, it, or a Growlithe, uh, where it does basically the sorting for you. You give it the flags, you tell it what you're going to do with it, and then it will give you the right heap back. Uh, and so you don't have to hard code anything, because right now you have to hard code which heap your application needs, and you just have to know that. It makes for non-portable code. So uh, we do have a couple users of ION left that we need to convert over uh, before we can call this done. Uh, GStreamer is one of them. We have some binary blob GPU drivers, although ours, at least the Gradlock piece, I went ahead and converted over uh, for us. Uh, but there's a lot of tutorials and reference material out there that still points to ION as the way to do things. So it's a gradual process there. Um, a couple more questions, but they look generic enough. I'll just answer them at the end. So uh, again, we, a couple missing bits this is a kind of continuation of the last slide. Are we are we really ready to get rid of ion? Just uh, what are what are our bits missing? We've got divert deferred buffer freeing. So this was an optimization where uh, you would release a buffer, and ion would would keep it around. It would put it in a list. And then when the system's idle, it would come back and actually do the freeing and the page zeroing. So it's a neat little uh, way, to, way, to, way to speed up certain operations. Uh, but that's going to be specific to certain systems, whether that's actually faster or not. So I personally don't think that's something that needs to be decided in the kernel. Uh, but others disagree, so we're looking into that. Uh, and DMA buff, or debug FS stats uh, that DMA buff had. Uh, just the regular DMA buff uh, API does give you some stats. Um, but ION also had some additional stats, which were neat. And I think they were used for some user space programs to you know, show how much, uh, like, like a bar graph kind of thing, how much memory you're using, how much memory different programs are using. Uh, and should we report if how much uh, memory is left? So that's the same thing. How do we, how do we know how much we've uh, used, how much we have left? Certain heaps like system heap, where it's just system memory, all it's going to do is give you how much system memory you have left. Whereas carve out heaps would probably be more useful uh, because you have a set amount and you could have multiple carve outs throughout your memory space. And you'll want to pick the best one based on how much memory is left or some other heuristics. Uh, that's why we would have it. Uh, big missing piece uh, is your heaps. This is just a called action, uh, lots of vendor ion heaps out there, uh, convert them and upstream them. So the sooner we do that, we can start to find, you know, problems with the DMA buff frameworks and start to start to fix them and, and find the missing pieces. Cause I'm sure there's missing pieces. I've, every time I convert some user of ion, at least internally to heaps, I find some missing pieces and it's better to get them out of the way early. So I'll stream your heaps. Uh, I guess before I go questions, just a couple references, acknowledgements, John Stoltz. Uh, so he was kind of the guy who he, you know, saw this as this is the way to go. And, and he kind of really took over everything. So uh, I think he went 16 versions, uh, patches upstream to get it submitted. So this is uh, really kind of his, you know, his project. Um, Submit who, um, those are DMA buff heaps, the DMA buff maintainer, which DMA buff heaps is obviously based on uh, and uses um, for most of what it does. So uh, it's really now the maintainer of DMA buff heaps. Um, and Laura, who 
Uh, again, Ion is basically turned into the May buff heave. So she maintained Ion for you know years and years and years and did all these cleanups that led us directly to DMA buff heaps, which is basically now ion destaged. So those are relevant folks. And then I, you can go to the mailing list and, and just see all the comments and contributions from a whole bunch of folks. Okay, uh, let's see. I guess I'll look at some questions and uh, answer some questions. Try to go in order here. Let's see, there's a question. Are there still things missing for DSP or PRU remote proc support upstream? There are, but they are not related to DMA buff heaps. Uh, a lot of interrupt controller and stuff like that that needs to get sorted out. Uh, next question. Is it not a good idea that the current owner of DMA buff either producer or consumer, let me publish this. Uh, producer or consumer does the cash operations. So I, it's going to be, at least personally, I think it's best that the exporter does the cash operations. Uh, it basically has the list of attached devices. And so the devices themselves are doing cash operations. It it really wouldn't have a full system picture of, of who's doing the cash operations. So a, a central authority on cash operations is what we're going for here. Uh, so all these different devices, they all they have to do is attach and signal when they're being, they're using the buffer based on mapping and unmapping uh, and everything else the the exporter should handle, which is why central exporters uh, is what the MA buff heap is is trying to do so that we can get more centralized uh, exporters so we can handle the cash operations more efficiently uh, if you're talking about inter-device cash operations so for instance gpus and remote processors that have caches on them uh, really everything i've talked about so far as far as caching i'm talking about from the processor that is running linux perspective how the device caches uh, know how to synchronize with each other that is that is up to them and it's usually handled with uh, fences and fence syncing so you you know you put in a put in a fence and then the device themselves would ensure that their uh, their caches are in the good in the right state the memory is visible uh, to the other devices before signaling that fence now let's see what else we got Publish this question. Okay, does this mean that TI will be dropping uh, CMEM and changing to ION? Uh, yes, in a way, it's not called ION anymore. It's called DMA buff heaps. But yes, we're dropping CMEM. Uh, we have done it for uh, our newer platforms, AM6, um, J7. For AM5, like you mentioned here, which is on the BeagleBone AI, uh, that's still a work in progress. I've seen it done, but it won't be on our next SDK. It'll probably get pushed out to the one after that. But yeah, it's going to reduce a lot of that uh, that carried uh, patches we had uh, to make the CMM allocator work. Now we're going to upstream all that and it'll be the DMA buff heaps allocator. And it'll be in use by the DSPs and the EV processors. More questions. Limited for device, for example. What way? Security information. Publish this question. So, security implications of DMA buff to user space. I'm not sure if you meant DMA buff heaps to user space because DMA buff is already a user space uh, thing. Uh, if you're talking about um, DMA buff heaps, then yeah, there are some security issues you need to worry about. Um, the different heaps all need to behave correctly. They need to zero out their memory. Um, 
so that the next user can't go and look into what the previous user had just written there. Uh, and that takes a lot of time to, to every time you pass the buffers on or I mean reallocate from a heap, you have to go and clear all that memory out. So some folks just don't do it, uh, which is a big security problem. Uh, as far as reliability security goes, you're, as I was saying before, you can basically just, if, if you can get to the DMA buff heaps, you can drain the system of memory and do like a denial of service against whoever was you going, who was intended to use that memory um, by the system integrator. Uh, and for less complicated socks, it becomes less important um, immediately because you're basically just going to be using system memory anyway. And there's a lot less buffer passing and zero copy going on. Uh, so for you know, risk V cores, although uh, that really doesn't change much. Uh, we've got whether you're using ARM or risk V as your main processor, it's, it's much more dependent on the peripherals you have. If you have a camera that needs to then feed a GPU, that needs to feed a, you know, some kind of AI accelerator, and then out, you, you're going to want zero copy across all of those. And that's where the DMA buff heaps is uh, going to be useful uh, so that no particular one of those devices has to actually handle allocating you have a third party allocator that then feeds all of those different accelerators and does the right thing as the buffer passes between them. So let's see. Uh, could you point to the TA tree for sharing buffs? Uh, I'll get on Slack and if, if you ask me that, I'll, I'll get the links all together. Um, I didn't realize that I didn't put them here on this last slide. That's yeah, my bad. All right. There's Alki. Uh, question was, um, will the slides be available online? Uh, yeah, I think that one could be answered by our moderator. I'm, I'm pretty sure these are all going to be online um, somewhere. Uh, my understanding was this will all just end up on YouTube, and the slides will be a link somewhere. If not, like I said, uh, find me on Slack. I, I can just send you the slides. Um, they come right back here. Okay, so this question is basically, um, it's, it's, it's asking more about the different types of cache memory you're going to get with DMA buff heaps. Uh, DMA buff heaps does not define a specific type of memory. The individual heaps that you allocate from uh, are going to be deciding what type of memory you're going to get. So if you want a cached uh, memory heap, then allocate from a cached memory heap. Or, yeah, if you want a cached buffer, allocate from a caching heap. Uh, we, we try not to enforce that in the core. Uh, that was something that Ion did where you could pass in flags and you would, it would try to give you the right memory. Uh, and it would choose whether it should be cached, write back, write through, write combined, whatever. Uh, we, we try to avoid that simply because a lot of times uh, you can't actually change the type of caching that a memory location has. So if you've got a kernel virtual address um, or kernel virtual linear space address, you'd have to actually go out and zap all the pages on ARM. Otherwise, you'll have mixed attributes in your MMU, and that can cause all sorts of problems. So if, if you... For performance, if you want to do the cache maintenance yourself, allocate from a cached heap, and then DMA buff already provides uh, an IO control for syncing and unsync, which basically just calls right on through to uh, uh, prepare buffer for CPU access. So you would you'd mmap it and then run the sync operations as you choose, and that takes care of it. For, for you. Uh, does let's see, we got this question. Let me just publish this. I think I'm doing this right. Um, <clears throat> does the DMA buff heaps uh, have an equivalent user space library like libion? Uh, no, we do not. Not yet. Uh, so far, uh, because all we do is we provide a single file with a single. IOCTL that you can operate on it, I've n we've not needed that yet. 
So when it gets more complicated, yeah, I think I think we're gonna make a uh, a lib DMA buff heaps. Uh, but right now, it's it's just not been needed uh, because it's 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 just the one octal. Uh, one benefit of having though a library uh, that I see is that you won't actually have to in your code. Uh, include a kernel header, which they can change and stuff. So the library kind of will abstract that for you, which is, is something we're looking into. So I'll do that next. Um, uh, it looks like all the questions. So uh, I guess I'll be hanging out in the Slack channel. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, let's see. And yeah. Not really sure how to shut this thing down. <laughs>